Good evening, everyone. We're pleased to welcome you to our next History Talks at Kane Community Forum. First, we thank you for coming last Thursday to our conversation with New Jersey State Attorney General Gerbeer Graywall. To those of you who were unable to make it, this, the recording will be shared when it becomes available later this week. Tonight, our topic is history, memory, and monuments. This summer, protests erupting in the wake of the murder of George Floyd in many parts of the country became directed towards the many public monuments across America that protesters judged to be symbolic of, supportive of, or complicit in the systemic racism that runs through American history and contemporary society. As a result, statues of a wide range of American historical figures, though mostly Confederate political and military leaders and Christopher Columbus, were toppled some to great ceremony, some out of uh, seeming concern for safety or order in the middle of the night, others pulled to the ground by the angry energy of the crowd. To counter these actions, President Trump issued an executive order on building and rebuilding monuments to American heroes and proposed a garden of heroes, seemingly an intended garden to be populated with statues of those Americans he deemed worthy of inclusion. Um, the list includes a wide range of, of names from the apparently underappreciated John Adams, um, Susan B. Anthony, um, Davy Crockett, Frederick Douglass, Amelia Earhart, and, and so forth, um, ending with, um, in alphabetical order, Orville and Wilbur Wright. As a result, the debate about American monuments has taken on a renewed urgency. Yet how to memorialize the, the past has always been fraught. So think for a moment um, about, I'm going to share these. Think for a moment about the Emancipation Memorial that currently stands in Lincoln Park in Washington, D.C. While the monument was actually funded by the formerly enslaved, when it, when it was unveiled in 1876, Frederick Douglass, who spoke at the unveiling ceremony, used the occasion to illuminate Abraham Lincoln's all too slow move towards emancipation and problematic views towards African Americans that contrasted directly with the benevolent depiction of Lincoln freeing a grateful enslaved man still wearing the shackles of enslavement. If problematic in 1876, the statue is even more so now. At an AHA webinar dedicated to this very topic earlier this summer, eminent historians Annette Gordon-Reed from the Harvard Law School and David Blight, Frederick Douglass biographer and historian at Yale University, could not agree on what to do with this statue now. Does keeping it celebrate Lincoln's issuance of the Emancipation Procla Proclamation? Does keeping it perpetuate a vision of white salvation of African slaves and eliminate agency of the enslaved? Does removing it sanitize the past by removing a cruel historical reality represented by the shackles? Figuring out what to do then necessarily involves doing a lot of history. For monuments themselves, as we just saw, have a history. Whose past is being memorialized? From whose perspective? How? In what form? In what context? And with what objective? To educate? To commemorate? And then a monument's reception must be considered. What has it meant since its erection and to whom? And what is the nature and meaning of its setting? Does the monument have artistic value and who gets to decide? One group of historians has adopted the hashtag, we want more history. And that's the approach that we're taking tonight, seeking more understanding and context to explore the examples of contested monuments, including monuments to Christopher Columbus as considered by Dr. Obede Freer, to the Confederacy with Dr. Regal, to more recent examples with Dr. Perkis looking at the Vietnam War Memorial, and then Dr. Kacher on recent artistic attempts to address these questions. As with past webinars, our forum tonight is being recorded. You can contribute your questions tonight via email to kuhist at kane.edu or kuhist. We don't have the chat function tonight, but we're monitoring that email account and, can, and we'll see your questions there. And with that, I will turn over the podium to Dr. Gordy Freire. So good evening, everyone. Thank you, Dr. Hyde, for the introduction. So for me, today is Indigenous Peoples Day. No Columbus Day for me, thank you. Christopher Columbus is not someone that we should be honoring with a holiday. Even a cursory review of the documents produced by his voyages 
and eyewitness accounts make it clear that he imprisoned and enslaved the Tainos across the Caribbean. His brutality greatly contributed to their destruction as a people. This, despite the fact that most of the Tainos greeted him and his fellow seamen with gifts and kindness. So I really applaud the recent actions of Newark Mayor uh, Ross Baraka in removing the statue of Columbus from Washington Park. The mayor and city officials plan to replace it with a statue of abolitionist Harriet Tubman. Over the years, I've had many spirited debates about Columbus's legacy. Uh, recently, someone argued passionately that it was too soon and a knee-jerk reaction to eliminate Columbus from our national pantheon of heroes. And sadly, it's hard for some people to surrender their heroes. Um, so I responded as diplomatically as I could muster that we have known about Columbus's debaucheries since he first sailed the ocean blue in 1492. Historians of a prior era chose to ignore his treatment of the Tainos because they did not view them as significant. They were not people that counted. In his day, Columbus was not only criticized for his treatment of the indigenous, but for his cruel punishment of fellow Spaniards in the Caribbean, and not to mention his incompetent handling of the colonies. So for historians of a bygone era, like Samuel Eliot Morrison, and that's uh, who I'm displaying here, his famous book uh, on uh, Christopher Columbus called Admiral of the Ocean Sea. It was the civilizing and Christianizing that mattered. And so he's really uh, one of the best example of a historian that praises the conquerors and ignores the conquered. So here's a brief excerpt from the very book here in front of you in the slide summarizing Columbus's accomplishments. I quote, the whole history of the Americas stems from the four voyages of Columbus. And as the Greek city-states look back to the deathless gods as their founders, so today a score of independent nations and dominions unite in homage to Christopher the stout-hearted son of Genoa, who carried Christian civilization across the ocean sea. So for Morrison, the history prior to Columbus is irrelevant. The religious faiths held by early communities, earlier communities are irrelevant. So this painting here is at the admissions office at Notre Dame University in Indiana. Uh, we visited there some years ago with my son on a Midwest college tour. And so you can see this traditional uh, imagery about Columbus, the Morrison interpretation depicted in this painting. Columbus is standing adjacent to a cross with some uh, indigenous folks, presumably Tainos kneeling before it. He merely had to show them the cross and they immediately found their true savior and abandoned their other uh, religious faiths. Here is how Bartolomeo de las Casas depicted the conversion process in his 1552 book, Destru Destruction of the Indies. So in this image, that is the Taino chief Atue prior to being burned at the stake. He politely declined to become a Christian. I think you can see from this slide where my family's sympathies lie when they dressed me up for this photo. Still as a boy, I was fed the Morrison version of history. And that made me angry when I unplugged from the matrix in graduate school and started to understand his legacy. So this is more modern me. This is me on that same college visit expressing my feelings 
for Columbus after years of studying the historical accounts. Now, in the outrage over the George Floyd murder this summer, people started to express their anger, as Dr. Hyde noted earlier, by rejecting, rejecting the sanitized historical narrative of the past. They wanted a more honest historical reckoning. They wanted to dispense with the mythology. And some of that outrage led to the vandalization of Columbus statues across the nation. So this image is of a headless Columbus statue in Boston. This led some brought up on this sanitized version of history to claim that the protesters and academics like me were trying to rewrite history. And I can understand this reaction since we have done such a good job of cleansing our past of inconvenient truths. So uh, speaking of that, I just wanted to read you a short excerpt from Donald Trump's uh, message uh, on Columbus Day today. He released it in a press statement. And he chastises folks like me. So I'll just read you a brief excerpt. Sadly, says President Trump, in recent years, radical activists have sought to undermine Christopher Columbus's legacy. These extremists seek to replace discussions of, this va of his vast contributions with talks of failings, his discoveries with atrocities and his achievements with transgressions. Rather than learn from our history, this radical ideology and its adherents seek to revise it, deprive it of any splendor and mark it as inherently sinister. They seek to squash any dissent from their orthodoxy. So I thought it'd be important so we not squelch dissent that I read to you President Trump's excerpt, or at least an excerpt of his statement. So um, bringing the, the topic of the Columbus statuary closer to home, this is a bloodied Columbus statue from Garfield, New Jersey. Uh, this summer, someone poured paint, red paint on it to uh, symbolize his blood-stained legacy. So let me be clear here, I do not endorse the vandalism. Uh, for the record, I have no objection if some communities want to keep their Columbus statues. But at the very least, there should be a statue of a Taino alongside it to engage the conversation over his legacy. If we want to look at his legacy, then let's really open the door to a discussion and a debate. So I feel that that might be the best way. I, I remember when there was a debate about the Columbus statue in New York City at Columbus Circle. I thought rather than taking it down, what a wonderful opportunity to encircle it with some statues of the Tainos, Hatwe, uh, Enriquillo, and a few others. Again, to open up the discussion about his legacy. Yes, he's an important historical figure. There's no denying that. But, um, you know, I think it's important to get that other side. Just a, a quick point, because some folks always raise this issue of he's a, an icon to Italian Americans. In, in doing further research, I realize, and Morrison states this very clearly, that he didn't consider himself Italian. He was a son of Genoa, the city state of Genoa and Genoese. And there was no United Italy at the time. And he didn't speak Italian. He spoke Ligurian, which was a, a, a version of um, Etruscan uh, that predated the, the Roman Empire. So anyway, I just thought it was it would be good to give you that. So anyway, I, I believe that putting the Taino statuary adjacent to Columbus, that that would be appropriate historical statuary and would open people's minds to the discussion of legacies. So thank you with that. I uh, thank everybody for listening. I believe. Doctor, yes, Ryan. Dr. Regal. Mm -hmm. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, great talk, Frank. Um, 
I, I'm currently working on a book on, on I call it the Columbus Project. Uh, it's only partly about Columbus. It's mostly on the, the non-Columbian myths and legends about who really discovered America. Um, uh, uh, but I do have a, I do have a chapter about Columbus and it's, and you're right, there's, you know, there's just this huge amount of material to, that, that historians have known you know, pretty much forever uh, about the, the various perfidies of the Grand Admiral. Uh, I wrote a, um, an op-ed about Columbus Day like three, four years ago, where I said a lot of the things that we're saying tonight. And I got a lot of angry hate mail over it, including from one guy from a local uh, New Jersey Italian American Association who was really upset, sent me like a three page single space type letter uh, in which he uh, finished up by saying that uh, I was just one of these liberal academics and I clearly hated Italians. That's why I did this. And I, I said to him, well, how can I hate Italians? I, 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 love, I love pasta. You know, I, I love eating Italian food. So how can I hate Italians? Um, but I, uh, I would like to talk uh, for a few minutes about the Confederate statues. Uh, the, um, one of the, you know, we've had a rash of Confederate statue vandalizations and removals in the past few years, which is nothing particularly new. We sort of go through phases uh, where it, it sort of calms down and then it gets riled up again. Uh, and I think the, as Dr. Ogode pointed out, that the, the recent killings of African Americans by the police uh, have you know, sort of churned this back up again. Uh, and one of the great, or one of the big complaints about uh, this, the, 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 the tearing down of statues and the vandalization of statues is that, well, oh, you're trying to erase history. Uh, no, that's, that's not it at all, because statues are not history. Statues are mythology. Um, mythology is what we use to sort of tell stories uh, in, in a way that makes us happy. Uh, and so statues of all kinds, not just of Confederates, or not just of Columbus, uh, but of all statues in a way are a kind of mythological propaganda to make whoever the, the subject of the statue is look good. Uh, we usually don't, don't put up statues to people we hate. We usually put them up to statues we love, uh, people we like or admire. Uh, you know, I'm sitting in my home office here right now and right, you can't see it, uh, but right across from me, I have a bust of Ben Franklin. Uh, and that's a mythology. Uh, it's not history. Uh, and so you can, you can tear every statue in the world down. We'd still have history. Uh, so that's really not, uh, not an issue. But uh, with a little history of Confederate statuary, uh, most uh, Confederate statues that are up now did not go up immediately after the war. Uh, they didn't go up for, in some cases, decades. Uh, after the war. Initially, the, the monuments that went up to the Confederacy were largely at cemeteries, at places where Confederate soldiers were buried, uh, and there would be a plaque or a little obelisk or something would say that, uh, you know, uh, in this cemetery, X numbers of the, you know, the 4th Atlanta Cavalry were buried here. Uh, and we don't really start getting that kind of figurative statuary that we sort of associate now. Uh, until much later, and it, it was it starts off being like Robert E. Lee and Jefferson Davis and Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, the biggies, uh, when sort of figurative statues, realistic statues start appearing, it's usually those guys, uh, and then to lesser degree, sort of anonymous Confederate soldiers. And uh, they often went up in public places, uh, mostly in the South, obviously. Uh, as far as I know, here in New Jersey, there are no Confederate statues. There is one uh, Confederate memorial, which is at a cemetery where some Confederate soldiers who had been captured or were being held in a prison camp uh, died and were buried there. Uh, but I think that's, as far as I know, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but there are no Confederate statues in in, uh, in New Jersey, so we don't have to worry about that. Lots of Columbus statues, although not as many as we used to have, but, uh, <coughs> uh, and what you see 
if you look at when these statues are put up and where they're put up, because that's really the key to this whole thing, there's sort of two major phases of the erection of, of uh, Confederate statues. Um, you had this sort of first phase, roughly 1890 to about 1920, uh, peaking at around 1910. And if we then take that and try to put it into some context, that's the era of Jim Crow. Uh, and the other phase, roughly about 1950 to 1970, with the peak around 1963. And again, if we sort of what's going on in America at the time, that's the height of the civil rights movement. And so the, the argument that these statues are just to sort of commemorate uh, Southern heritage, I, 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 I've often been in conversations with people or seen people talk about, uh, well, we, we, we fly the Confederate flag, we put up these statues. It's not about hate, it's about heritage. Well, the problem there is the heritage of the Confederacy is a heritage of hate. Uh, you know, hate of African Americans, hate of Native people. Uh, and, and so they were put up, for the most part, during these periods of uh, where African Americans and civil rights are starting to sort of come to the fore. And they were put up in places which were meant to remind African Americans that, okay, Maybe the South lost the Civil War, but white supremacy is still running things down here. Uh, and so that's why you would see these statues go up on the lawns of courthouses and, you know, in front of police stations and, and you know, uh, um, town halls and things across the South. Uh, it, it was less about reminding uh, white Southerners about the Confederacy than it was to remind black Southerners who was really in charge. And uh, for example, probably the, the physically largest uh, Confederate statuary, the, the Stone Mountain sculpture, which is right outside of Atlanta, which is this huge um, sort of side view portrait of um, Robert E. Lee, and I believe it's Stonewall Jackson on horses. Uh, it's sometimes referred to as the Confederate uh, Mount Rushmore. It's a, it's a huge statue carved right into the sort of living rock of the mountain. Uh, and that went up in 1914, again, at the height of the Jim Crow era, um, paid for largely by donations from the Daughters of the Confederacy. Uh, one of the interesting aspects to all this is that white women, white Southern women, uh, were a driving force behind a lot of these statues going up, uh, and the Ku Klux Klan as well. Uh, they gave money, they supported these, the, the putting up of these statues. Uh, and so this is, this is all part of this sort of, you know, there's the, there's the superficial meaning of the statues that, uh, that this, oh, this is just about re remembering our, our um, Confederate heritage, our Southern heritage, but the underlying, the really the sort of core of this is to remind uh, African Americans of white supremacy uh, and to sort of help help the, remind white supremacists uh, and bigots that you know we're we're still in charge here. It doesn't matter what happened. Doesn't matter we lost the Civil War. We're the, we're still the ones in charge. And so that is the message that gets torn down when the statue gets torn down. Uh, and so I think part of, the, part of the backlash against the removal of statues comes out of that sort of realm of thinking. And don't forget this, I'll, I'll finish up with this, uh, the infamous Charlottesville riot uh, where, the, where the young woman was run over by a car being driven by a white supremacist and you had all these guys out there with their tiki torches and their khaki pants. Uh, this centered around a statue of Robert E. Lee that some locals were beginning to say, maybe we should take this down. Uh, and then this kind of backlash started and then a backlash against the backlash. And the next thing you know, uh, people are getting crashed into by cars. And um, in the end, what happened is that the, the local authorities took the statue down once everything sort of calmed down and the crowds went away, uh, they took the statue down and renamed the park Emancipation Park. Uh, and so 
this is part of this long uh, sort of dark heritage that we as Americans, uh, no matter who we are, uh, have to acknowledge and live with and say, okay, yeah, the, you know, it's okay to acknowledge past evil deeds. That's how you fix them. Uh, it's like if you, if, you don't, if you don't admit you've got a disease, uh, the disease kills you. Uh, you admit you have a disease or you admit you have a broken arm, you get it fixed and it takes, you know, that makes it better. Uh, and so this engagement that, that we should be doing with statues from the Confederacy, statues for, of Columbus, uh, dealing directly with this dark history we have is really the way to move forward. To not do it is moving backwards. So I'll, I'll, I'll end there. Hi, everyone. I'm going to talk now about the creation of the Vietnam Veterans Memorial. Um, I apologize for the change of scenery. Our internet's a little unstable tonight, so I went closer to the router. Um, as Dr. Hyde said in the beginning, monuments themselves kind of have an origin story, and I think it's really valuable to talk through that origin story of a memorial that was at the time very contested, to think through the decisions that are made um, in how we capture a, a memory, right? How we capture a memory in the moment and then how that memory gets, gets adapted, evolves as our kind of current contemporary landscape changes. So the way the Vietnam Veterans Memorial was interpreted in um, 1979 or 1981 is quite different from how we think about it now because our memory of the Vietnam War has shifted. So I'm gonna talk, talk you through that, that origin story. So America, uh, Americans leave Vietnam in 1975, and many, many people just wanted to put the war behind them. In May of that year, President Gerald Ford, just weeks after the fall of Saigon, says, quote, the war in Vietnam is over, and we should focus on the future. As far as I'm concerned, that is where we need to concentrate. And early on, this desire to move past the war really reverberated throughout US society and US culture quickly there emerged this recognition, right, of the need to deal with the division, divisions that had emerged in our society here throughout the war, and especially how to contend with the massive population of returning veterans. You know, this was quite different from veterans returning from World War II who were seen as heroes, who were given parades. In Vietnam, veterans were kind of cast aside. Um, you know, the anti-war movement here, the way the war was understood, um, really made it difficult for people at the time to distinguish between the war and the people who fought it. And so by the late 1970s, many people are starting to believe that the best way to bring the nation back together is through this process of memorialization. Vietnam is a really particular war in U.S. history, right? It's one of the very few wars, um, certainly up until kind of where we are now, that the U.S. lost. And so the idea of memorializing a lost war was, was challenging, right? It's much easier to lionize something that we won, lionize something that we want to remember positively. But how do you deal with a war that didn't go the way you wanted it to? How do you deal with these questions of, of loss, of, of um, not being seen as strong? All of these are kind of issues that the United States was wrestling with. So in April of 1979, a veteran named Jan Struggs leads the charge to establish, establish the Vietnam Veterans Memorial Fund, which is a nonprofit organization charged with spearheading the campaign for a National Veterans Memorial in DC. And Scruggs really believed that this space, this physical space for memorialization could both foster national reconciliation and bridge that disconnect that I just spoke about, the, the separation between the experience of veterans and the war itself and the experience of veterans versus the experience of civilians who didn't understand necessarily what had happened in Vietnam. What he wanted to do was create a memorial to recognize the service of military personnel without honoring the war itself, which remained so contested. So Struggs, uh, Scruggs gets the support of a number of members of Congress who introduce a bill to pass federal legislation to authorize the construction of the monument and to put it in the Constitutional Garden on the Washington um, Mall, which 
you know, starting in the early 1900s becomes kind of talked about as this site for memorialization and national celebration. It's really significant that the Vietnam Monument, Veterans Monument Memorial becomes put on the mall. It's kind of hallowed ground. And the senators that um, are seeing the war as, uh, uh, seeing the monument as ne necessary to our national memory are looking at this as a way to curate that memory in, on this hallowed ground in this space where we remember, you know, Lincoln and Jefferson and we have our Civil War monument and it's really this space for reconciliation. So on the fifth anniversary of the fall of Saigon on April 30th, 1980, the Senate passes this bill authorizing construction for the memorial. The government will provide no financial support that will all have to be raised privately. And the design will require the approval of the Commission of Fine Arts and the National um, Capital Planning Commission, as well as the Secretary of Interior. So it's kind of this public-private partnership with which President Carter quite um, supportively signs into law on, in July of 1980. That October, the Veterans F Memorial Fund Committee holds a national competition for designs. The memorial, they said, they want to, quote, promote the healing and reconciliation of the country after the divisions caused by the war. So that's the call they put out to artists who, whose uh, designs they're seeking. And initially, this proposal receives broad support, but it really becomes clear that the, as contested as Vietnam remains in uh, American society, so too does how people want to memorialize the war. And that kind of weighs down this process from the very beginning. Also weighing down the process is the, the landscape of the commission itself. So we get eight white men on the committee. It includes architects, sculptors, and landscapers, and not a single veteran. These are the people that are going to make the decision for the design. And they wanted, they, they were charged with finding a proposal that was both reflective and con contemplative that would harmonize with its surroundings, that would contain, contain the names of the dead and missing, which is significant, right? And it would make no political statement about the war. So a pretty lofty charge in a moment where the memory of the war is still so politicized. The, the, the nation responds, right? And they get 100, the committee gets 1,421 entries, the most of any design competition in the United States or Europe to that point. And the winner, and this was anonymous, all of the entries were anonymous, um, which is significant because the winner ultimately states that she doesn't believe she would have been chosen if her identity was shown. Um, the winner is 21 year, a 21-year-old Yale undergrad named Maya Lin. And I would like to show you a quick picture of Lin, not necessarily the image of kind of an acclaimed um, Oh, what was working before I moved my computer is no longer working. So I will not show you the picture of Lynn today, but she's a young 21 year old Asian American woman. Um, and her design was a series of black granite walls on which would be inscribed the names of the 58,000 men and women who gave their lives or remained missing in the war. If anybody who, um, any of the other speakers tonight are able to share their screen and pull up a quick image of the memorial. Um, I would appreciate it. Any image will do. So her design is meant to be apolitical, but the politics of the war just pervade this discussion. Her, her design gets um, condemned for its lack of patriotic symbolism because that had been so characteristic of war memorials to this point. Ross Perot, thank you. So that's actually the picture of Lynn that I was gonna show. Um, again, this is the designer. And then if you pull up one of the images of the memorial, you can see the black granite that Lynn designed. So no patriotic symbolism, right? Ross Perot, pledged, who had pledged $160,000 to support the project, he calls the memorial a trench and he withdraws his support. Veteran Tom Cathcart, Cathcart says that the black coloring is the uni universal color of shame and sorrow and degradation. This, this dark color, this kind of black gash that people talk about wasn't accidental. 
Lynn later said of the design, quote, I imagine taking a knife and cutting into the earth, opening it up, and an initial violence and pain that in time would heal. So ultimately her design is built as, as designed um, with additions and modifications to ameliorate some of these concerns of her more powerful critics. And then later in 1993, actually, there is added next to it a, a monument for the women who fought in the war as well. Despite all the controversy that surrounded it initially, the site really quickly became a sort of pilgrimage for those who had served in the war and for those who had lost loved ones in the war. And less than three years after it opened, the New York Times noted, quote, it's something of a surprise how quickly America has overcome the divisions caused by the Vietnam War. Lynn's memorial, in fact, helped to heal that divide. It became a sacred place of healing and reverence exactly as she intended for it. And by, you know, 10 years later, nobody thought of it as a controversial monument. Nobody questioned the design um, kind of in national lore. I'm sure there were individuals who did, but as a, as a, as a culture, the United States really embraced it. This is a significant story because it tells us that the, or, you know, the origins of a memorial are, are created out of the world in which they're cast in that moment, right? So the interpretation of a memorial when it's built will change, as I said earlier, depending on the interpretation and, and landscape of the world in which we're living. And so the Columbus memorials, the Confederate memorials that were seen as so heroic early on when they were, when they were first built and first imagined, their context has shifted. And as a nation, we need to grapple with that shifting context and think about how we interpret and reinterpret those moments in our collective imagination. I'll turn it over to Dr. Kater at this point. Thank you colleagues and thank you to the history department for this uh, forum and these interesting presentations. I'm uh, coming from the art history side on the topic and asking the question uh, with the emptying of old forms, what is the contemporary artist to memorialize or monumentalize today? And surprisingly, uh, one of the contemporary issues that's come into focus has been the issue of race uh, itself in this country. And I wanna start with uh, two examples by African-American artists uh, in some detail and then briefly touch on uh, in part two, a number of ways that contemporary artists have uh, undermined or opposed the idea of traditional memorialization. Last time in the forum, I spoke about uh, Kara Walker her silhouetted uh, cut out um, darky town rebellion. So I thought it made sense to continue uh, on that thread with her very recent commission for London and the uh, Tate Gallery part of their ongoing series in the vast uh, turbine hall, um, creating uh, what she called uh, reference, uh, a really complicated and many layered uh, work referencing the uh, whaling voyages and the concept of the Black Atlantic uh, and how that was represented in art by Turner, Homer, Copley, and sailors uh, drawing from these previous examples and um, reversing them um, to put together or to yoke uh, the ideas of racist representation and the violent expression of powers, uh, power issues that have tend to become romanticized. So this is a tough memorial that um, asks the difficult questions as is often said and does not romanticize uh, the issues. Uh, it's also very complicated and multi-layered. So on one, uh, she said other things about it and there's been quite a bit of uh, words uh, from Kara Walker and in the catalog to the uh, exhibition of the fountain. She's also called it a one woman world's fair, a space of, and also a space of joy and contemplation. Uh, in its form, it's a, she has pointed to the Queen Victoria monument outside of Buckingham Palace 
as one of the origins uh, of this kind of tiered uh, monument and sort of a repurposing of that so-called heroic form with uh, victory on top that was uh, in place after uh, in the early 20th century after Queen Victoria uh, passed away. Uh, Walker's fountain, as I said, presents an allegory or extended metaphor of the Black Atlantic. It's a term uh, introduced by the historian Paul Gilroy to acknowledge the legacy, how the legacy of the transatlantic slave trade has shaped the development of Black identity and culture in America. Uh, in typical Kara Walker fashion, the work has an enormously long uh, title in a kind of arch 19th century advertising form. Uh, come one, come all sort of thing uh, to the Fons Americanus, a daughter of waters. Um, and she presents the artwork as a gift to the heart of an empire that redirected the fates of the world, namely the British Empire. So to look at the kind of multi-tiered uh, complication, starting on the bottom and the two basins which catch the water coming down from the top, um, we have uh, this image on the left of the man adrift in the shark-ridden uh, sea, uh, the black man, uh, which is clearly a quotation uh, from the Winslow, famous Winslow Homer painting that I hope some of you know from the Metropolitan Museum, the Gulf Stream, uh, together uh, with a little bit of humor. So instead of the uh, Key West designation on the boat, uh, Kara Walker has shortened that to K, West, the initial K, and therefore opened up a possible allusion to the musician Kanye West uh, as the man adrift. Uh, so you have this kind of pop culture tongue in cheek. And then the title of the whole air, that part of the basin, uh, references a, the famous shark, since sharks are an issue also in Homer, uh, the famous shark of Damien Hirst, <clears throat> probably the most famous piece of contemporary British art, <clears throat> excuse me called the physical impossibility of death in the mind of someone living. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> so Walker calls this section of the work, the physical impossibility of blackness in the mind of someone white, which is certainly a salutary uh, caution to us. Moving up to the second layer of the cake, uh, there are four figures on the cardinal points. Uh, on the left is uh, a rather saucy Queen Vicky, uh, obviously Victoria, but repurposed and caricaturized, uh, almost simian with a huge gigantic crown and holding a coconut, very strange figure indeed. Uh, another, another cardinal point uh, is more positive, the image of the captain, which is to represent uh, sort of the, the black uh, figure who struggles for emancipation going back to Toussaint Louverture uh, and his rebellion to free the slaves uh, in Haiti. Another side is rather gruesome uh, without figures, just a old gnarled tree and a noose, a clear reference, uh, rather disturbing one to uh, lynching in America. And the whole thing topped uh, at the summit instead of victory, uh, the figure of Venus uh, who pours forth the waters uh, from both her breasts and her neck, uh, though it looks like it's coming from her mouth, uh, the journey of the water and the uh, apotheosis of the daughter of the waters. To show how that looks uh, on the whole, the view that many people have taken, including Kara Walker herself celebrating the opening, um, has been from the captain's side, and it's very hard to find any photographs uh, online from the Queen Vicky side, which seems to be fast becoming secondary point of view. 13 meters high, quite a tour de force, and quite a complicated uh, shuffle of histories uh, of the Black Atlantic, of linking America, Africa, England, in a very complex uh, kind of shuttle, also raising issues of gender as well as race. The second um, work was suggested to me by Professor Hyde, uh, Kehinda Wiley's uh, recent monument, which appeared in Times Square this summer, The Rumors of War, Wiley best known for his, as the official portraitist to, uh, for President Obama, 
uh, here tackled sculpture for the first time and also in interviews uh, a sculpture to be made for the Monument Avenue in Richmond uh, to replace those that are being taken down, uh, which Wiley interestingly proposed. Uh, some of them are quite handsome uh, bases, wonderful architectural structures, and Wiley's proposed that these bases should be filled by contemporary versions and honors to uh, other heroes, such as the, like analogous to the Harriet Tubman being inserted uh, in Newark. And to me, that, that suggestion is very clearly from the example in London, back to London, the so-called Fourth Plinth uh, series of commissions that have used the empty, uh, never finished uh, fourth uh, sockle or base uh, in Trafalgar Square, a very central important place in London for a series of exhibitions and installations by now over 10 contemporary artists. The most uh, recent one is the uh, very successful, I think, uh, Michael Rakowitz, the Chicago area artist of Iraqi Jewish uh, descent, who's been very concerned with the looting of monuments uh, in Iraq and shows here the uh, winged bull Lama Su that was destroyed by ISIS in 2015. He brings it back with a kind of pop uh, scaling of uh, all of these little colorful bits are tops uh, are cans of uh, Iraqi date oil which has been another uh, subject that he has uh, researched. And I think it looks great as a kind of gateway portal type sculpture in the first place, uh, rhyme in position with the columns of the classical architecture around and with these processional uh, rising stairways it fits in and also fits in. Uh, Rakowitz has said uh, faces, the sculpture faces Mecca and turns its back in its uh, hindquarters on the British Museum. So a nice little in-joke to him, I guess. It's back to Wiley. Um, I do think that uh, his equestrian is very close, uh, really seems to almost mimic uh, or appropriate the uh, Jeb Stewart monument in Richmond, which is meanwhile gone down. Uh, there's of course one intensive layer of uh, response to the monument with all the graffiti underneath, uh, but with the, the sloping a uh, plane rising, the foreleg raised of the horse, the figure twisted in the saddle, it seems to me uh, uh, really a kind of repurposing of that monument, replacing, of course, the Confederate general with the uh, figure of a person of color. And we understand the significance of that substitution, but I would suggest maybe the attempt to revive the equestrian monument form uh, might be a bit misguided. So as I said, for my second part, I want to uh, overview a few strategies to demonumentalize or ways in which uh, contemporary artists have helped reverse or undermine that mythology of the statue that was spoken of, uh, short of lopping off uh, their heads or destroying them as we've all already seen. So one of them is uh, by the late great uh, Christo, uh, known for wrapping buildings and bridges, but in fact, uh, early in his career, wrapped a number of statues, thus muffling or concealing their uh, identity or historical statement uh, and making them into Christos. Um, similarly, just written up uh, in the paper was rather this rather eccentric um, performative um, intervention by the great uh, David Hammonds uh, with the, the uh, Beecher Monument uh, in uh, Brooklyn and which he's gone out uh, for several winters in the snowstorm and clothed the African-American figure woman who lays palm fronds at Beecher's uh, feet. Uh, kind of a coloristically astonishing note and, uh, and a sort of decentering, of course, of the, of the heroism uh, of, of, of uh, Beecher instead to focus uh, on the presence of the African-American supposedly ancillary or secondary figure. Uh, and similarly, uh, the idea of screening or covering uh, at, a, at uh, something of a distance, like this paravent by Kenseth Armstead uh, in uh, Union Square uh, a couple summers ago, was an interesting overlay, a partial overlay of designs from uh, frescoes from Burkina Faso in this wonderful colored design, which kind of completely destabilizes the heroic weighty bronze of uh, Washington, and I think is a uh, 
you know, an example of a way, uh, it's, it's almost a visual analog to putting up a plaque which would explain uh, the title 2020, which is that 20% of uh, America's population in the colonial period were enslaved people and 20% of Washington's troops at Yorktown were African American. So you can have a plaque to that and it probably is what the plaque says, but you also have this sort of cultural paravant or screen to, uh, to the traditional bronze uh, heroism that I think is visually very disruptive and effective, although not, not damaging at all. Uh, along the same lines, the idea of projection, the great uh, Christophe Orgisco has been doing this for decades uh, on buildings, but has turned in more recent years to statues. So again, in Union Square with Lincoln, uh, projecting uh, as a screen for the faces uh, of Iraq war veterans and also for their voices. So there's literally uh, also with Lincoln in his more recent uh, series of works, the House Divided uh, series, in which there's projection of uh, immigrants and refugees uh, onto the statue of Lincoln and that makes a speaking likeness, which literally adds another voice, an underrepresented uh, voice uh, to the voice of uh, the traditional statue. <clears throat> so I have a feeling that the idea of projection uh, which Isco used has somehow uh, filtered to uh, Dustin uh, Klein, who's created this uh, ongoing series of projections on the Lee a memorial in Richmond, uh, kind of branding uh, Lee and his horse with the initials of the Black Lives Matter movement, which is a great gesture, and then using the base uh, as a sc screen, essentially, for changing cast of characters. Here, the glowing uh, face of Breonna Taylor. But this uh, rather ambitiously, uh, this statue and projection changes apparently every day or two. Uh, and uh, Mr. Klein has said that. Um, He's felt the dark energy of the Lee Monument towards Black people in the space since 1890 and wanting to recontextualize some of the negative energy with positive Black energy. So it's been a kind of screen show or folio uh, of uh, Black heroes and thinkers here, uh, the great Frederick Douglass, of course. Uh, other writers, uh, John Baldwin, uh, John Lewis, uh, musicians, uh, and also even African-American artists like Basquiat and Gordon Parks. Uh, all of this, I think, in a, effectively creating another discourse uh, for the monument and uh, sort of erasing its original uh, intent or, or obscuring that uh, in a way that I think is very positive and gives us uh, quite a bit of food for thought uh, without uh, actually uh, erasing the artists who made the uh, original Sculptor, sculpture for whatever reason. So anyway, thank you and uh, look forward to questions and uh, discussion. So thank you everyone for, for these really provocative presentations. I think that we have um, a lot to talk about here. First, I would remind everyone that while we don't have our chat feature enabled, you can email us at kuhist at king.edu, kuhist. Um, Dr. Perkis and I are monitoring that, um, that email account so that you can get all of your questions to us there and we'll pass them along to, um, to all of the, the panelists. Um, while we wait for your, your questions to, to come in, I, I um, have to say I'm just absolutely um, fascinated by the, the way in which um, these contemporary artists are working to, to as you said, repurpose um, the statues and monuments that are already in existence to try to find ways to redefine their meaning, reflecting the new, the new context. Um, and I look forward to seeing, I guess, how the communities in which these works um, reside when they're in communities that aren't in the middle of a museum at a very, um, to see how they're how they're embraced um, or not and to see to what extent um, these revisionings become a more permanent reflection of this shift in, in context so um, I guess we we all wait to see how that <laughs> to see how that proceeds um, I wanted to, um, again, while we wait uh, on questions coming in, and I'll to allow each of you to address to address each other. So, um, Dr. Perkis, and then and then Dr. Gary Freire. 
I actually, we, we had a great question come in early on, so I would like to mm -hmm. pose it. It's mostly for Lewis and Brian, though I suspect anyone should feel free to chime in. Mm -hmm. um, it's from one of our other art historians, Dr. Mayhall, and she asks for a little bit of more context and nuanced discussion of statues versus, versus monuments, because in the context of this conversation, mm -hmm. right, a statue is also art, or at least that's how we conceive of it. So how do we kind of reconcile the removal or adaptation of art versus these memorializations and statues? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll take a shot at that. <clears throat> uh, I, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the detail, how do we, is a, is a statue a monument, is a monument a statue, are, are they the same thing? Um, and how do we justify taking one down but not the other. Um, there were calls when this sort of thing reached a peak over the summer. You know, oh, you're tearing down Confederate statues. Why aren't you just tearing down statues of Lincoln? Why aren't you tear down statues of, you know, Franklin Roosevelt? Uh, and I, I think part of the answer to why some statues were targeted and others not <clears throat> is because Lincoln and Roosevelt didn't try to destroy the United States. The Confederate leaders who have made, have monuments to them tried to destroy the United States. They were a, they were a, a, an enemy nation uh, whose sole purpose or primary purpose in their own words uh, was to create a, a white nationalist homeland where black people could be legally enslaved. Uh, and so I, I, think that the issue here is that statues that represent, uh, you know, support slavery, back up slavery, back up colonialism, uh, these are statues which people will say, well, it's okay to tear that one down. Um, whereas the, the something which is memorializing someone's life, and I think statue is, is something which, uh, if we're going to define what a statue is, it is something which memorializes a person's life in one way or another. Uh, and so to memorialize the lives of someone who were war criminals and who enslaved people uh, and did terrible things like that, you know, we wouldn't be putting up statues to Goebbels uh, in this country or, or to Hitler or Himmler uh, because they were terrible, horrible, awful people who did terrible, horrible, awful things. We put up statues to those who you know, helped rescue Jewish people. We put up statues to uh, those who ran the Underground Railroad because they were doing something, for lack of a better expression, we're trying to do something positive rather than negative. Uh, and I, I, I hope I answered the question in there somewhere. Lewis is an artist. Yeah, I would you just say, yeah, I would just say uh, basically to me, statue uh, implies a figure, you know, whereas a memorial like the Vietnam memorial uh, or the Holocaust memorials, you know, are non figurative or more generic. Frank, Frank, you had a question, and then we'll take a question for you from uh, from email. Great. So, Lewis, I was very intrigued with your uh, uh, display and your presentation on art. And so I was wondering, you mentioned in one point that you thought it was misguided, some of the horse statuary, um, you know, in one of the images, I guess, it had to do with the Stonewall Jackson, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, statue was taken down and then someone put up another figure, an African-American figure, and you thought it was misguided. Could you explain that a little bit? Or did I, did I understand you correctly? Yeah, um, it's a more of a critical judgment. Because um, as we see, all of, you know, all of these artists use appropriation. So, you know, Kara Walker appropriating Winslow Homer but it's for a kind of discourse um, with Kehinda Wiley and the rumors of war. I just feel like he's, he's appropriating the form, the equestrian form of the, 
you know, the man on horseback be a Confederate or whatever general or hero type. And it just seems to me that's such, such a stale, old stereotypical form that uh, I can't quite get uh, enthusiastic about the idea. Well, although I understand and admire the intention of, you know, turning that to an African-American subject, I just think the, the whole, you know, the whole framework of the equestrian going back, you know, to ancient examples is just a little bit tired. Thank you. Mm -hmm. We have a question um, for um, Dr. Godefrier, most mostly. Um, Dr. Perkis, do you want to read that, that piece? Yeah, we've just had a few good ones come in. Um, yes, we're just, Dr. yeah. <laughs> for Dr. Freer, how do you believe we should take the conversation about other problematic colonial pioneer or pioneer monuments beyond Columbus? You know, someone is asking me recently about the Jefferson Memorial in Washington. And uh, for example, um, you know, uh, it's a beautiful monument. It looks really gorgeous. And, um, I would argue that, so I think Jefferson is too fundamental a figure to just take down his monument. So, and uh, I favor doing, um, I guess, I don't know if this is the right term for it, but counter programming or counter statuary. I think that in the Jefferson Memorial, there'd be a very fitting place to include, you know, images of the slaves that he held until he died, perhaps most notably Sally Hemings. I think there's a place for that kind of discussion and statuary in and around the Jefferson Memorial that would put his legacy into clear focus. I mean, obviously he's a talented, gifted person who contributed a lot to the nation, but there's some other sides to him that are worthy of historical exploration. I, I might add that his treatment since I was talking about Columbus earlier and uh, the indigenous, the Tainos' treatment of them, I might add that Jefferson, uh, his actions against the indigenous, even spelled out in the Declaration of Independence, right in his own language there where he calls them savages. And um, during his presidency where he uh, unleashed a series of military campaigns which border on the genocidal against some of the indigenous communities. So I, I think that there's a place for that. So that's how I would deal with a, with a, with a monument like that of a, such an important figure like Jefferson, counter programming, counter statuary to evoke the other aspects of his heritage that are not particularly uh, enlightening. I think that's a, an important point. I just wanna jump in briefly. There are many other countries that memorialize hard stuff well. Um, you know, take Germany, for example. They don't shy away from talking about the Holocaust or the history of, of Nazism. And they do so in a way that, is, um, that confronts the reality of it, but also in ways that are artistic and meaningful um, and open to interpretation. And I think our country could learn a lot from the way other nations memorialize really challenging moments in their history. Um, there seems to be a retreat from nuance often in our statuary. And, and uh, I think we need to, so that we're actually giving people a, a clear view of what happened. I think we do need more nuance, you know. Dr. Hyde, would you like me to read another one? No, that's fine. Um, so <laughs> I would like to end with, with a question that's less about memorials and, and more about history education more broadly. And before we get to that one, um, again, this is a question about kind of art, art and monuments at the same time. Um, should memorials be figurative? Should we have images of people um, in them, perhaps the success of the Vietnam Memorial or the Holocaust Memorial in Berlin 
is due to that non-figurative nature, is due to the more abstract imagery. Um, I'm going to, uh, Louis, would you mind starting with that one? Yeah, I think the great success of the Vietnam Memorial is that it isn't figurative, but it names and names, and also the geographic, you know, what I found visiting there, just the descent, uh, the staging of it, you, you literally are buried by the increasing number of deaths uh, year by year. And uh, I think that's been a tremendous, you know, a rare, tremendous uh, memorial that I think has probably touched off some similar kinds of events, but certainly, you know, open a certain other similar uh, sculptures. I'm trying to think of the one, the name of the one in Washington for the uh, victims of lynching, which uses repeated um, rectangles and is sort of along that line of counting the, you know, just the sheer naming of the number of, of the horror or the number of the deaths. So yeah, I think it's, I mean, I think, and I showed the screen over the Washington. I mean, I think there's, there's a lot of possibilities and, and it looks like commissioning bodies are more open to, you know, non-figurative memorials. I think that's, uh, or monuments. And I think that's an encouraging sign. Plus we didn't mention the, uh, you know, the amount of money the Mellon Foundation is now going to throw at this question. Uh, I, I hope there's a lot of artists that have sat up and take notice <laughs> about that door opening. Um, I'm not an art historian, but I have spent a lot of time studying memorials and monuments. And, and I would agree, Lewis, that, that often you can transcend the political a little bit more if you don't have the actual figure of people, whoever those people are. Um, I personally also find memorials that don't have individual people to require a little bit more pause and reflection and interpretation, which for me makes it a more powerful experience. I'm thinking of the boots lining the riverfront in Hungary, in Budapest, and I don't know the name of the memorial, but it's haunting um, just to see the absence of people, right? The absence of figures. So. Um, as a non-art historian, but a historian, I find those to be some of the most compelling ways to memorialize the past. And that question of, of reflection um, is, is, is one about education, right? It's about getting people to reflect on the meaning in a way that is, that is intended to, to educate um, um, more, more, more meaningfully. And, and um, that takes us, I think, to uh, to our, our last question as we think about this issue of commemoration and or education. Um, I think we, we want to we, we want to we want to get to the and as opposed to to the or. So Dr. Perkis, you want to raise um, the last question? I do and, and I'm going to combine it with another one that just came in because um, I think they're linked. The, the one that just came in asks kind of how do we find a happy medium where we can recognize and memorialize various points of view without being, as, as the questioner asks, kind of overly sensitive. Um, and then this question about education, which wraps it all together, is shouldn't we be talking more about how we teach history and what the requirements for students should be who learn history in order to have a substantive, healthy movement forward before you know, we can move on from where we are now. We have to learn about the past. So where do we go from here? And you're, you're preaching to the choir on this panel, but uh, it's a good question. Dr. Gordy Freire, would you like to chime in? Yes. Um... So, um, I mean, for me, it's always, uh, I think you're right, that education is at the core of it. I mean, uh, as I was alluding to in my uh, PowerPoint, I was force fed a completely mythologized version of history. And when I started to uh, explore it as a graduate student, I, I, I felt very betrayed by 
uh, earlier teachers that I'd had, well, perhaps they didn't even know it, you know, come to think of it, because uh, they probably went to school and, you know, my grammar school and high school teachers may not have known that either. And I think um, so often we've created this mythology about Columbus Day, dare say I, Thanksgiving uh, is another one. And rather than having a serious look at these things, our children are brought home with, you know, crayon drawings of Columbus, uh, that poem about Columbus, uh, turkeys, uh, you know, that, that imagery of, you know, Puritans and Indians together at the Thanksgiving table. Uh, so there's a, something right from the beginning that creates a mythology that is disturbing for me. I mean, I was always talk to my kids when they would come home with that and say, you know, by the way, uh, these stories are not quite like that. And I realized some teachers say, oh, you know, we have to tailor these for younger kids. Uh, but I think that we can tell our children uh, closer approximations of the truth than what we've dared to do in our society. And I think the reason for the anger is the mistrust and we've been misled about what our history is. And so when you, when someone then tries to tell you, well, no, this is exactly more, this is closer. I mean, I use the word truth, this is closer to what happened, then people are angry. Why are you taking away my Thomas Jefferson? Why are you taking away my George Washington? Why are you taking that away? You're taking away my history. And it's hard for them to understand that you're actually giving them their history. You're actually uh, bestowing upon them their history, if you will. Uh, but they feel that you're taking it away. So I do think it starts at an early age. And I, and I think panels like this, and I've preached about this issue of Columbus for a long time. And so I'm so happy when I go into my classrooms of my students, you know, who are now teachers and their interpretations are more nuanced. Uh, so it's a slow process. I think that's the way to reach. Uh, it's a long term process. So that's a term where we're actually reconciling the multiple nuances and interpretations of our history and, and we can come to peace with it but only after we've given it careful thought after we've acknowledged it then we can come to peaceful terms with it so i think that's the long uh, way of doing it other than that we're going to continue to squabble about it uh, and that that there's probably some value in that too that squabbling is probably has great value too. I don't think we should run away from that squabble. So I read mm -hmm. Donald Trump's missive tonight about Columbus Day because I'm willing to engage him in that. And I think that's what we need to do. Yeah, so anyway. I wanted to chime in on that question as well. Um, I was a an undergrad when 9-11 happened and I was taking my first history class in college and the professor on on September 12th 2001 said okay we're going to put aside what we were going to study today and we are going to analyze the film coverage the the news coverage of 9-11 and we're going to think about the history of journalism and the history of how we cover national travesty national atrocity right and it was this lightning rod moment for me. Um, it totally changed my career trajectory. And I tell my students every semester, you know, there are different ways of studying history and there are different ways of teaching history. And for me, history is an activist um, discipline. And I don't say that in a partisan way. I don't say that in a political way. What I mean by that is I interpret, my, my reason for studying history is because I think we need to understand the past in order to con contextualize our present and find a path forward for the future. And I know that's not how every historian feels, but it's one of the reasons I feel so grateful to be a part of Kane's history department is because most faculty and kind of the culture of the department 
is to do events like this, right? It's to take our expertise and our, our understanding of the past and try to use that to make sense of where we are now and think about where we go from here. And I think in our curriculum, in our Gen Ed History 1062 class, in our public programming, um, that is what we as a department aim to do. And I, I hope that it helps to foster this sense of, of a path forward of using our, as Frank said, our, our messy, squabbly understanding of the past to figure out where to go from here, so. Wonderful way to close um, and closing as well with a challenge to all the future teachers who are attending this event tonight and as you think about how, how you teach the past to your future students. So thank you everyone for, for coming tonight, for listening, for contributing your questions. Um, we will uh, circulate links to the recordings of this once it, uh, once it becomes available. Um, and watch your inbox for emails announcing the date of our next community forum. Thank you everyone, we appreciate it very much. Good night.